That fear-mongering has consequences, and the consequences are what we face today. The diagnosis back in 1986 meant a death sentence. That was when I started to see the darker side of what it's like to be someone living with HIV. How have perceptions about HIV changed from the 80s till now? I'm Ben Hunt, and this is On The Cards. The documentary AIDS The Unheard Tapes brings to life audio tapes of real testimonies of people who lived through the HIV epidemic. Of course, it is worth noting that AIDS is no longer an expected outcome of living with HIV in the UK. On the couch, we have Mark Thompson, Jay Hawkridge, Phil Samba, Ruby Rare, and Harry Whitfield. Ruby, as a sex educator in today's world, can you explain for everyone at home, what is the difference between HIV and AIDS, please? Sure. HIV is a virus that's transmitted from person to person. And basically what it does is it weakens your immune system. So when it goes untreated, HIV turns into AIDS. AIDS can't be transmitted from person to person. It's only HIV that can be. So we've got a table with uh, three cards on. Each one has a different statement. Harry, over to you. Jump on in. What does it say? Even though we have come so far in terms of science, we haven't got a pill to deal with the stigma. The wider community was turning on gay men. Terrible, terrible things being said by very senior people. It was the chief constable of Manchester who said that we were in a cesspit of our own making. It is a form of human behavior that is a weakness in the fabric of society. So these are some headlines that are literally just clips from the documentary. Have a read of it. AIDS will wipe out all gays by the year 2000. AIDS, this human cesspit, spread of AIDS blamed on degenerate conduct. What's on your card here? Would you kiss an AIDS victim? I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. And fear of AIDS may start gay cemeteries. So we saw in the documentary that huge stigma grew as a result of these quite ridiculous headlines around HIV and AIDS. Harry, you're very public. You're in the public eye. You're a celebrity. Um, <laughs> in some circles. Me, in some <laughs> circles. No, I didn't say it. In these I, circles, I'll take clearly. It. <laughs> clearly in these circles. We're here for a reason, boo. Um, Tell me about the stigma that you see. Have you seen it change? Are you still seeing some of these headlines in the media? Uh, but I don't think there's any headlines like this in the media. But I think if you look at TV and film, it's often used as a storyline in a negative and stigmatising way. And yes, when I spoke about my status and came out more publicly about it, I did get some horrible messages. And did you? Yeah, and it was things that played into the stereotypes and played into these stigmatizations of it being a dirty thing, you know, something that I should be ashamed of. So have things really changed that much then, if you're still getting things like this? I think things have changed a lot because today the, the stigma is worse than the virus, in my experience, from what I've been through. You know, I live happy and healthy and I take one tablet a day and it's absolutely fine, it's very easy. The hardest thing is seeing so many young people tell me about their education and the health system in their country and it's the struggle of, of people living abroad and having to pay for this medication. Mm. And I know this, we're, we're talking about the UK here, but this is bigger than that. This is a big worldwide topic. We need to use our voices and the ever-growing opinion of acceptance yeah. in this country to help push that worldwide. So one of the things people go through when they're uploading these experiences on social media is they will get some negative feedback, and I guess that can be quite an isolating experience yeah. if they're not prepared to deal with it. Jay, I'm going to come to you. We saw quite a few patients in the documentary who said that they became isolated and lonely mm -hmm. after their diagnosis. What were your experiences like? It's kind of subverted for me, in a sense, okay. is because I was diagnosed just before the COVID crisis and the first lockdowns, where I was actually able to, thankfully, stop and stay in the gaff and, you know, really understand my status. And at the time, I was able to be in a wonderful and loving environment with someone that really gave me confidence with my status. So off the bat, I was there feeling supported, feeling encouraged, and really came to a wonderful, self-assured place as someone living with HIV today. And then I took all this confidence and all this love and I said, you know what, I'm gonna try and do something with it and I'm gonna jump online. And then that was when everything changed for me. That was when I started to see the darker side of the reality of what it's like to be someone living with HIV, even today. So I've always had the internet as my friend. And then to, to go online and share something so vulnerable and so public and so worldwide with TikTok, for example, 
I realised very quickly that the internet's not always your friend. In what way? What kind of things have you seen? Those little comment cards, you know, they, they, they've got a lot of buzzwords that kind of I have learned to kind of see on the daily in my TikTok comments. It's a really strange thing because you get all the hate, you get all the, the, the homophobia, for example, but then you, you get the ignorance is the worst thing. One thing that really, really bugs me, I get a lot of people going, oh, you know, I, I'd still date you, you know? I, I, I still I still want to get to know you. For instance, at the start of it, when I was maybe a little bit shakier with my status, I was like, oh, thankfully, I'm still valued, I'm still wanted. And then you get to a certain point with your status and you go, wait, that shouldn't matter. If someone is telling you that they still care, are affectionate, love, support you, despite this, the word still is still, still there, mm. you know? It's still someone who is, for whatever reason, unable to look past this thing and they're still seeing that as an obstacle that they are so you know wonderfully choosing for you to go above and beyond to get out the way of it's a really petty thing but it's something that really struggles with me sometimes i don't think it's petty at all i think that the language used around hiv positive people and dating is something that's a massive issue that comes from stigma and there's so many evident words and phrases like clean <laughs> and dirty and Gosh. and stuff like that. That if, if you were to go on certain social networking dating sites, you would see plenty of it. That is the stereotype that, that was enforced back in the day and it shows the ongoing use of it and the impact that it has. And even the marble slab advert, the effect that that had on educating people was, was brilliant. But that fear mongering has consequences. And the consequences are what we face today and what you face today on those messages. I mean, I think reading these is, you know, a really stark reminder of how absolutely horrendous it was. You talked about mental health and the link between mental health and, and HIV. And I think it's really important that HIV doesn't cause mental health. But the impact of stigma, which many of us with HIV, we internalise. And Harry, you said that, you know, you had really negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. You had thoughts as well. I have. And that very often comes from the stuff which is outside, which we turn in on ourselves. So we feel unclean, we feel worthless. It had a very profound effect on my self-image. I mean, I actually did think that I was some terribly infected being and I actually began, I felt guilty for getting this illness. When I did work with people who were newly diagnosed, the one thing they would always say to me when they got their diagnosis was, not that I'm gonna die, was not that I'm not gonna be able to work, it was that nobody's ever going to love me again. Wow. And that is a huge issue, because we all want to be loved and to be held and to be respected and wanted. And that's one thing that's taken away, and that's what stigma does. That's how it starts to impact on your mental health, because then you start to isolate yourself. Then you're like, well, actually, I could go online and look for a date, but I've got to put on there my HIV status, which means that somebody's going to ask me some stupid questions, you know, or bring all of this, and I don't need it. So what more needs to be done? The visibility of people like us is really, really important. And I think conversations like we are having today, which are intergenerational, you know, which have sex ed experts as well, are really important. I think that's where it can happen. Absolutely. I think, I think the best thing that we can do is to just continue to normalise the conversation. Okay. And that can seem like a massive, massive uphill battle, but you've got to think about playing this as a long game. There's also, like, an entire generation that grew up doing their sex education during Section 28. Riding on a renewed wave of homophobia, the government proposed a new law, Section 28. The central provisions are that homosexuality must not be promoted in state schools, and it outlaws teaching the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. When I was in school, I was taught um, to put a condom on and that, that would prevent pregnancy, and that, that was the beginning and the yes. end of my sex education, but that wasn't useful to me. So I find it kind of wild that years later, there's a lot of young queer people still in schools not getting like inclusive sex education on how to navigate um, going to sexual health clinics or to prevent STIs. Lots of teachers and school leaders today will have been trained under Section 28. Yeah. It's always like just trying to pan out a little bit and see that all of this change is really exciting, but it's gradual. It can't all happen overnight because we all inherit shame and fear and stigma from previous generations and like previous times in history. Thankfully, Section 28 is behind us. Its legacy is still very much here. You just touched on dating there, and I do want to talk about dating. So I'm going to open this up. Tell me about your dating experiences when it comes to disclosing or potentially not disclosing HIV status. 
I've had a really bad experience, actually. Like, I, I got diagnosed when I was 18 years old, and I've dated a couple of people in the time since then. That's been seven years. And before that, I was in relationships. So why the Committed relationships. It does feel like baggage now. It feels like baggage that I've got to go and... to tick off a box of, oh, this is wrong with me, do you accept that? Mm. So it kind of feels like I'm still on this sort of lead that I've been on since being diagnosed, trying to get further and further away with it still, you know, ragging me back. Jo? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting thing. I think one of the easiest parts about being public on social media is that most people generally have some kind of an idea of who you are now by the time that they physically meet you. So, like, luckily, a lot of the time, I don't have to introduce myself as someone living with HIV because, you know, you get someone's number or you get their already, Instagram and they can see you. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to dating, dating apps or dating profiles or anything. I mean, when you've got Instagram, you kind of don't need to. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> DMs are popping, clearly. I'm like, what's, what's going on in your DMs? Like, no, like, I do, I really... I really like to talk to people when I'm out and about in a public capacity, and I think that's the one thing that maybe never will go away when you are talking to someone, so you swap numbers, and then it's kind of... It's almost like a countdown of how long before they meet this part of you, which is always a really unnerving thing because you never know how they're going to take their reaction to your status. You may then have to explain and educate a partner or a date, and it just becomes a little bit potentially fatiguing over time. That's the main thing that I've noticed in the past couple of years. Yeah, it can seem like this baggage that you sexy. have. Not at all. And, and, you have to, and also, I think it means that you then get that initial reaction that that person has. To get that first response that probably, most likely, has the, the like inherited fear and shame attached, and then having to sort of feel like you need to talk someone out of it, that's and, really And tricky. the deflating, you'll understand this, I'm sure, the deflating kind of realisation that it shouldn't be our responsibility to then go off and do this, you no. know? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to say, because I think my relationship to telling people about my HIV that I'm dating has evolved alongside the virus. There was a time, you know, way before social media, when I felt it was my obligation to tell you. I had to tell There was no legal requirement, but I thought if I was going to get intimate and I wanted to be with you, it was really important that you knew. So you had a choice. And then as time went on and I felt much more confident, I got to a point where I was telling you because I wanted you to know about my virus okay. because it was important you got to know me. Time has evolved and I became undetectable, which means if you're positive, you're taking treatment and you're undetectable, you can't pass the virus on. I was like, okay, so I'm gonna tell people because that means I can have the kind of sex that I like, which is, you know, really important. And then finally, my last stage in the evolution is I'm undetectable, PrEP's available, I can't pass HIV on. Why do I need to tell you? There's no moral obligation, there's no legal obligation. You tell people because you want to. I was dating a guy um, a while back. We were dating for quite a while and I really opened up to him about my status and about my experiences and about my other health stuff that was going on that was kind of holding me back and had been holding me back for a good few years at this point. We were having a date in a restaurant and he was upset with me for leaving the restaurant to go and chat to my friend outside. Fair dues, we, I, we were on a date. But he in this moment, weaponized my HIV status what? and weaponized my, my sexual health against me in, in a loud, booming voice across this restaurant that made people stop and look, you know? And, and these experiences that I've had, they shape my view and, and, and my confidence with dating. And I think the less people view it as a negative thing, the less heads would be turned by him saying that in that restaurant. And the, that, that's the goal. I don't want to feel scared of him exposing my status. We've also just experienced something over the last couple of years that really helps and equips us to have better conversations about this. Yeah. Like, think about the language that we've evolved to, to have around COVID, mm. around disclosure, around testing, around consent. There's a lot that we can learn from there in moving forwards and not having that attitude and not being in situations where you're made to feel like you're apologising for being HIV positive. So for those of us whose DMs aren't popping like yours, Jay, um, <laughs> we may need to use dating apps. And on said dating apps, there is usually an option where you can actually state your HIV status. What are your thoughts around this option? Should it be there? Should it not be there? What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I think it normalises HIV and it puts it out there. I think the thing that I found challenging was that when I put undetectable, 
that the amount of conversations I had to have with people explaining that. So you kind of become an educator. When Is that you just, hiring? When you just want to date, you know, and it's your or day. Or something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when, you know when it's Who your day time? job, it's like, okay, it's my day job and I just don't want to be here and I'm looking for that. Okay, so Mark thinks it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, Harry? Yeah, I think it is a good thing as well. Um, the times that I've experienced stigma and negative comments have been on these, these apps when I have got that turned on, but otherwise people wouldn't, wouldn't know because you can't tell. You know, you can't tell. So I think it's really important that we are open about our statuses to normalise it and to showcase the wide variety of people who live happy and healthy lifestyles with HIV today. And I also think there's an element of stigma there that's when you are taken away from, from the community and you aren't a part of it or haven't educated, been educated around it, it can be used as a joke still. You know, I've had really? time... Yeah, I've, in, in recent months, I've sat having drinks with one of my friends and two other friends who were there together as well. One of them's a gay man, you know. Um, they had a cocktail in their hand and they passed their cocktail to their friend and they said, do you want to try my cocktail? And the friend said yes and they said, careful you don't catch my herpes or my AIDS. Ooh. But I did not finish my drink, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> the drink was over him. Um, and, and I didn't hold Gosh. back and I did educate this person, but that isn't good enough, you know? I, and if you hear somebody saying that, then it is your responsibility to call that out. But I do think it's a good thing that it's an option. Sure. But, but why is it only on... I think we all know the apps that we're talking about. Like, <laughs> why, why is it only on apps that largely cater to men who have sex with men? It's now the case in the UK that there are more new diagnoses of HIV within the heterosexual street, people street, yeah. than there are men who have sex with men. So I think we should really have the option to be able to talk about this and it not just exist in queer spaces. Yep. Cool. Have a read of the statement for us, please. What does it mean to be HIV positive today? OK, so I particularly want to start with you as a young person living with HIV. So can you tell me a bit about your diagnosis? How did it happen? What was going through your mind? Yeah, of course. Uh, so my diagnosis really took me off guard. You know, HIV was something that had never really occurred to me was a risk. It actually left me in hospital Gosh. and unconscious for six days. Um, which at the time kind of stumped everybody. And obviously with HIV, um, antibodies you know, take a while to present themselves in the body, so nobody knew that it was HIV at the time. But what I mean, did they I think it was? Crohn's disease, because of the weight loss. I lost about 10 kilos uh, in that six days, which, you know, as a lean lad like myself, was a lot to lose. Yeah. So I had, like, a CT scan and an MRI. Uh, they thought it was appendicitis, and then it was only because, actually, I had a couple of mates that encouraged me to go and get a follow-up sexual health test, because, obviously, even though I'd had blood work taken at the hospital and it had come back negative, Wow. They said, no, just go for our peace of mind. And then, lo and behold, here we are today. It was a positive result. And what was going through your mind? Um, I mean, luckily, this is, this is where it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Because I didn't have much prior knowledge of HIV, I was able to kind of approach it head-on for what HIV means today and was able to get to a really wonderful place with it. I think a lot faster than maybe a lot of people would have. People say there's such few cases here. It's an American disease. I remember sitting there feeling as I'd been hit in the guts. I was deeply shocked. What a terrible thing is about to descend on the gay community, on gay men in particular. A lot has changed since the 80s, but do you relate to any of the stories that you saw in the documentary? Yeah, I mean, quite a lot of the documentary was really humbling and touching for me. I think there's a, there's a brief part where people were talking about how difficult it was not only to approach a diagnosis, but to approach a diagnosis on top of a pyramid of already dealing with your sexuality and your identity and understanding all these changes in a world that wasn't particularly accepting of them. Mark, can you tell me a bit about your experiences, a different generation to Jay? Well, I was diagnosed in 1986, so around the time when some of the tapes were being recorded. There was very little information about HIV, and a diagnosis back in 1986 meant a death sentence. When I was diagnosed, my clinician said, we don't know, it could be six months, it could be a year. And I was 17, so that was really frightening for me personally. But over the years, with just, you know, a hope and a prayer, but really good support from friends and family and also a really good HIV community, which we have in this country, really helped me to get through. I started treatment in 2001. I've been on treatment ever since, which means that my HIV is completely under control. I'm no longer worried about, you know, HIV killing me, but just 
to kind of the bog standard things of getting older and you know dodgy knees really is more of a <laughs> 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 um, what's really similar between my diagnosis and and jay's at the time is that many of us still experience stigma and we still experience concerns about that you said that a hope and a prayer got you through talk to me more about what you were actually feeling um over those years because you must have said goodbye to quite a few people that you knew we have to remember that these were really young people i had to witness that and i went to funerals and i saw loved ones pass away and when you're faced with your own mortality Oof. at a really really young age it's really soul destroying but then you're also concerned that at any moment that could be you yeah. so you don't make plans for a future you know you, you worry about falling in love you know because you're going to lose somebody or they're going to lose you so it's really tough and really frightening and also really lonely and what were the options for treatment back then there was nothing nothing at all in 1988 there was something called the concord trial in this country where they tested out a drug called azt so azt had been a cancer drug and they'd found it was effective with people with hiv at the time and they put some people on this ben and it didn't do too well for lots of people but the good thing about azt was it became a jump off point for the developments of later treatment one of the first drugs that i took in 2001 had azt in it so it kind of worked out all right in the end. Harry, I'm going to come to you. I want to talk about your experience of being diagnosed with HIV. Does it relate to marks of yeah, hope I and praying? Yeah, I can, I can relate. I think there was a phrase used about, like, a punch in the gut and that, like, stomach-clenching, like, down a roller coaster feeling of, like, sickness at the diagnosis. I still felt a lot of dark things about myself because of what I had perceived the virus to be throughout my life. And that isn't through somebody telling me in specific words, that is through a widespread opinion mm -hmm. being pushed subconsciously. And it's also through being, you know, 15 years old in school and being clearly openly queer and seeing Harry Whitfield has AIDS written on the wall oh. as a child, you know, in school. That is the correlation between sexuality and AIDS and the crisis that is still kept today, except there is no education. What about in terms of treatment? I'm guessing you... Obviously, oh my treatment. God, yes. I mean, I was on treatment within the first month of being diagnosed. And similar to you, I was very, very sick at first, very quickly, except I kind of felt like I knew that I was positive, you oh. know? I was... I contracted HIV through a pretty traumatic experience. And so I was already in quite a dark headspace around the situation. And yeah, it took me a few days to, to do some self-diagnosing online and talk to my boyfriend about it at the time. Gosh. You know, it was, it, was, it was a really hard time for me in my life. And I was 18. So I also correlate with being so young and having to grow up so quickly and being faced with such a big complex issue with so much history and politics behind it. Right, on to the next card. Mark, the cards are on the table. Oops, my go. OK. Right, HIV is a disease of discrimination. In the documentary, we see the UK public initially perceiving HIV as a problem that only affects white gay men. Uh, to what extent does this still exist today, do you think? I think the perception is that HIV still overwhelmingly affects gay men, and then by definition of that, gay is often very seen as white. But I think it's really important to recognise and understand that from the start of the epidemic in this country, it hasn't just affected white gay men. It's affected lots of communities. Today in this country, the second largest group after gay men are women who are infected by HIV. And within that are black African women mm -hmm. as well. So again, the conversation has to really shift to be much more inclusive. Ruby, I'm going to come to you, because you've done a lot of work with marginalised groups. Can you tell me a bit about that? Marginalised people still do not feel safe a lot of the time in healthcare systems because there is so much conscious and unconscious bias. HIV has a lot of additional complications. There's a lot of shame and stigma that's been interwoven in healthcare and in wider societies as well. I was part of a project a while ago with Positive East. There were some amazing people leading it, which was all about going into Afro-Caribbean communities in Tower Hamlets and in Hackney. And the most beautiful moment of this was getting pastors to talk about HIV testing and the wow, importance of it in their like sermons to their congregation and then getting tested as part of that. 
And if you just think about that happening in the last five years or so, that makes me feel really emotional to be able to have those conversations and for people to stand up and do that work to try and normalise this conversation in their communities. It's accessibility as well, though. Like, mm -hmm. certain places and locations aren't accessible for the medication that is necessary. And it's also information. Like, not everybody knows that PrEP is available to everybody, which is a drug that you can take which prevents you catching HIV from somebody who is positive mm -hmm. and not on medication themselves. And it's quite commonly known and used in the gay community, but it's kind of got a stigma around itself as being a gay drug, a drug that sexually promiscuous people would take. In reality, it should be something that everybody who is having sex, unprotected, unsafe sex with strangers, should be taking, because it would be protecting them. We've, we've spoken about PrEP, but we've not spoken about PEP, yeah. which is, if you think about PrEP, almost like hormonal contraception to stop pregnancy, PEP is medication that you can take similar to the emergency hormonal contraception. So if you think you've been exposed to the HIV virus um, and you can access PEP in like most sexual health clinics and in A&E, but you need to access that soon after you think you've been exposed to the virus, within 72 hours. Same I with know PrEP that as well, that's available in, yeah, in, in yeah. most um, SCI clinics nowadays. PrEP is available in SCI clinics as well. Phil, I'm coming to you. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> just giving me, like, the eye. I'm Come just on. <laughs> as an activist and a campaigner, you're obviously working with a lot of people on the ground who are experiencing some of the things that Harry was talking about. Do you see HIV as a disease of discrimination? Yes and no. Mark touched upon um, some of the groups that it does affect, but when we think about migrants, a lot of people move to the UK and then they're getting HIV here, and there's not a lot of work around that. So there needs to be more specifically targeted work. Sometimes because of where these people are from, they're kind of left to their own devices and have to, to care for their own health care. I think it's really important to add as well that migrant communities are, have higher rates of HIV. It's not because we do anything that's different mm. to anybody, right? And I think it has a lot to do with health inequality. And we've seen that in COVID. If we look at lots of different areas of health where there's inequity, that is usually because it's related to poverty, it's related to lack of education, it's related to lack of access. In the past couple of years, we've seen huge, amazing drops in new HIV diagnosis in this country. And we should celebrate that. We've come so far, it's such great news. But again, we're seeing that overwhelmingly in cisgendered white gay men. Why is that? Because they have access, because they have information. It's interesting though, because even people within those communities, so the ones that are supposed to have access, still do contract HIV. Yep. I mean, we're sat with two individuals who are white, <laughs> who aren't from necessarily a marginalised group. So what needs to be done for them? I think it's what, what, what both, of the, both of you said, is that you knew so little about HIV, right? OK, I'm not a Londoner. I'm, I'm, from, yeah. I'm from up north. I'm from a village in the middle of Lancashire, you know? Like you say, I, we, I didn't have friends who were gay. I didn't know what HIV was. Yeah. Nobody tells you that you need to know about it. The one thing my parents and my, my family and friends said, be careful. Of what? <laughs> of what, yeah. Although I didn't understand what it was, I knew there was something big and scary and dangerous if I had sex mm. as a gay man. There's not that much education in terms of the history and context yeah. of HIV and AIDS with young people. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know that much growing up. And it was only when I became more educated within my queer communities that I learned about it. And I think we need to hold on to the history without making it, like, fear-mongering yeah. and doom and gloom. It's kind of a hard balance. Still, sadly, the majority of young people in the UK are not receiving any adequate sex education. Especially not around HIV or any gay sex. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just not... It's just unheard of. And that is why people like me still get diagnosed, even though I do have privilege. We all do very different jobs on this panel, but yours is very related to this topic. Uh, what made you want to get into it? So I run a small community interest company called The Love Tank, and we set that up to respond specifically to the sexual health and wider health needs of the most marginalised communities. And I got involved in HIV prevention and support work probably about 30 years ago, simply because when I was going into spaces, I wasn't seeing myself reflected. 
So I felt it was really important that I wanted to prevent HIV in men that looked like me. So I decided to set up organisations that responded to that. So that's kind of what the work is that I do today to try to make sure that, yeah, we're all heard and we're all included in the conversation. And it's not just you that works there on this panel. Yeah, it's not, Phil, no. you also work <laughs> at the same organisation. What made you want to get involved? Um, I actually met Mark and our other director, Will Nutland, at UK Black Pride. Okay. Um, as I was leaving, <laughs> if you remember this, my, um, they were giving out condom packs, and on the condom packs it said, um, there's a drug that you can take that can prevent you from getting HIV. Don't you think it should be available? I knew there was a lot of people around me that had no idea about it, and I just figured that like I could use maybe some of how I communicate and using social media and like writing things in order to like get the word out to like my community about what's available and how they can take care of themselves. Can't quite believe it, but it's time for the last question. You ready? <laughs> what resources and tools have you all found personally useful around HIV? Anyone want to jump in? I'll go. Um, probably because I've been kind of using them for the longest. <laughs> 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 I think in terms of resources, Ben, what I found the most useful has been the community of people living with HIV. So there are organisations like Positively UK that are based in London. Positively UK is great because they have a specific peer support programme. Places like Positive East in London. And if you want a kind of a big organisation, just get your questions answered. You can always contact the Terence Higgins Trust, you know, because the UK's national charity, and they'll kind of have a generic service for you. But if you want to speak to positive people, places like Positive UK, that's your first stop I'd go to. Great advice, thank you. Jay? I, yeah, I completely second uh, the people side of this. I mean, one thing that I have taken from my journey, when I first downloaded TikTok, I had no experience with the app. And thankfully, because of the way the app works, on this journey, I've had so many people that are also living with HIV that have since come to me. People who are also then becoming creators and also making content and kind of keeping the conversation going. And I think that's one thing that I'm really thankful for from social media is it's brought a lot of people that truly do understand this and understand me to me. And that comes with just being open, normalising the conversation, just being yourself. Love that. Some positives about social media. Harry? I use Positive East as a, um, as a really helpful resource when I was diagnosed. Not only do they have, like, gym facilities there and, like, a bit of a community and regulars that turn up, but they also have therapy and, and help in that sense with, for your mental health, which I 100% needed at the time. I was in a very dark place. And alongside the NHS and, and their incredible health service surrounding HIV, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very good. But also my friends and my community and those around me and art. Like, I think it's really important when you're going through all of this sort of turmoil to express these emotions and get them out of your body. Nice, thank you. Different. I'd echo a lot of the organisations that you've mentioned and then unsexy thing. So there's prep, PEP. There's also condom use. Condom use is still really important in preventing all STIs um, and getting tested regularly. Not sexy, but felt like the important <laughs> sexual health disclaimer that I needed to do. Good. Um, I kind of want to reiterate what has been said about community. I think that's extremely important. But I think a lot of like what I learned around sexual health came from like relationships, friendships, and even having sex. So mm. I think. I learned a lot kind of on my own. There are organisations like um, ours, uh, the Love Tank, but also sources from uh, LGBT Hero as well. Nice. If you or someone you know has been affected by any of the issues we've raised in this conversation, and of course, you can go to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line for some help. Right, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. You can watch AIDS The Unheard Tapes on BBC iPlayer right now. And make sure you click the subscribe button for more. See ya. Bye. Bye. The biggest thing that I'm learning on this journey is that there is an unparalleled amount of power in earning every part of who you are. I want people to take away from this that HIV has changed. We still have work to do around HIV stigma but today somebody can live a long, healthy life and they can't pass HIV on. I hope that people take away the viewpoint that HIV is not correlated to the stereotypes that were created about it during the crisis. And it's not something to be feared. 
I would want people to learn as much as they can around sexual health and also the history of the AIDS epidemic. I'd say that education that is inclusive, accessible and pleasure focused is essential in terms of HIV, healthcare and advocacy. For me, I just want people to watch the documentary. Honestly, I think this was an incredible opportunity to hear from everyone here. But at the same time, let's learn our history. Let's see what's happening back in the day. And that's what a documentary is there for.